again and welcome to Match Talk. I'm Tammy Simmons. And I'm Carla Garrick. And, and I'm gravelly because I've got a cold because, you know, that's one of those things. Remember we used to get colds? I know! People, so. I, yeah, like, I feel like I have to explain to people, like, no, really, I have a cold. I I get a cold pretty much every year at this time. And and honestly, I mean, because I get allergies, we have a new dog, yeah. all of that. But it's it's at the stage where you're like, oh, my God, I don't really want to sneeze in public. Yeah. I sneezed at Liberty Forum, and I literally felt like... You were like, oh, my God, offending people. I well, know. I was just like... I just sneezed. It's not, you know, yeah. like a, like a de declaration you know, of war. I think I know that it, I look at it two ways. One, either it's a cold, like we always get colds, right? Which it feels just like a cold. Or it's Omicron, in which case you should all get this because it feels like a cold. <laughs> I mean, so here's the thing, you know, I saw a tweet again this morning that was, um, so I guess what, the queen had COVID, uh, President Obama, Obama has Jean it, Shaheen has that's it. it. Uh, so all these people and all of them are like, oh, I'm triple vaccinated and boosted and I'm so glad because it's so mild. And I'm like, but it's you not, cannot claim that no. because you don't know. I had it and it was mild. So maybe right. it's just mild and right. you didn't need it. So right. I, I always think that's funny. I, Jean Shaheen's thing yesterday. She goes, I've got, you know, my three shots. So it's important that you all go out and get them ASAP. And so I'm that thinking, you too can get. I don't In know. Anyway, I right? mean, none I, of I it just, makes sense. Okay. I will tell you this, though. I saw a really interesting article on Substack. It's one of the um, economic people mm -hmm. who's just kind of been running the numbers since the start. Now, I don't know if you were following this, but Pfizer brought out a report about two weeks ago that has not been covered at all in the of legacy course. news. Uh, that is not good. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, I don't want to overstate it and be like, oh, we went to, a, you know, all this NATO war, Ukraine stuff is like this giant pivot to just distract people. But hard, you know, to be like, really, do we are we incapable of keeping two things in our heads at the Apparently. same time? Could we not talk about this data and talk about geopolitical issues or no, apparently not. But anyway, this guy on uh, on the Substack article, according to the CDC's own data, uh, excess mortality, so that again is when you compare year to year, if there was a pandemic, you would expect the excess mortality to be, to be significantly, because that's what a pandemic should be, higher than what you would expect in other years. So by way of example, here in New Hampshire, the excess mortality for 2020 did not exist. Arguably, there was no, no added definitional death emergency okay so uh this guy's report uh looked at excess mortality and for millennials okay so that is generally the people who are not really influenced by covid mm. the higher and older and sicker and obese and comorbidities uh diabetes all like the sicker and older you are the more likely this would kill you right so millennials for the most part not really uh deathly to them 61 thousand excess millennial deaths after the vaccine mandate was introduced. Hmm. That doesn't sound right. So putting that in context, there were 58,000 drafted conscripted soldiers who died in Vietnam. So you could say whatever that is, and we don't know at this stage if that excess mortality is as a result of COVID or if it's a result of the vaccines. But right. what we do know is it didn't look like that in 2020. It did look like that in 2021. After the vaccine was out. After. So, hmm. you know, do with that what you will. But I think one could say that if correct, that means there was a Vietnam type event that happened in millennials, like right. the people who are supposed to like run society in a couple of years kind of thing. History is just not going to look good on this at all. It's just not going to, I, I, there's just going to be way too much un unless we bury it. Well, so speaking of burying it, it is Sunshine Week. So this week is the week. It's a national program where we celebrate open and transparent government. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, uh, there was a really, really great, uh, program that was put together by the Naki Loeb, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Naki Loeb Institute. Yeah, something. Uh, I, I think I, it is. Um, so they are, uh, they're a free press, open first amendment, free speech, mm -hmm. uh, 
organization over in, in, on, in East Manchester, and they've always done these programs. We used to do them in person, and of course they do the Naki Loeb First Amendment Award every year. Still bitter that I didn't win it when I should have, but all right. Anyway, so they, um, they did a program last night. It was with Greg Sullivan, who's like my hero, First Amendment mm -hmm. union leader, lawyer, Jill Bissonnette from the ACLU New Hampshire, uh, Attorney Rice, who's the city attorney for mm -hmm. Manchester. She used to be one of the, um, I think she was an acting AG or yeah. a second in command at the Attorney General's office. And then a uh, judge who I'd never met before, he had a bow tie on, uh, Judge Justice Delker. Mm -hmm. And so they did like an hour and a half program. It was on Zoom, uh, just really talking about how successful the state of New Hampshire is with its open government. Mm -hmm. You know, are we trending more towards transparency? Are we moving towards secrecy and all of that. It seems like the trend is yeah. pretty good. You know, we had some significant wins in the courts in, in 1920 and 21. In fact, Right to Know New Hampshire has just asked the attorney general if they could update their memo yeah. so that, you know, we, we do truly reflect what's happening. But the big wins that they were talking about there, um, one of the things that would be really great, and if there's an activist who wants to work with me on this, I would love that, is to start to sit in on the police cert decertification mm. procedure, proceedings. So that happens up at, um, at Standards and Training up in Concord, yeah. and uh, it's once a month. And I actually think that's a really interesting way to sort of just look at what the accountability yes. is. So, so some police officers are being uh, decertified, those are usually for issues of credibility, mm. excess force, trustworthiness, that kind of stuff. The other um, interesting thing, just for those who have been watching this a long time, know we've talked a lot about the Lori's List yep. and the EES, which is the Exculpatory Evidence Schedule. And um, they released, the Attorney General's Office released some of the names, but then we introduced a statute that um, said, okay, for the people who feel like they shouldn't be on the list, we're gonna go through this X process. Mm. Now, X process turned into sealed yes. court cases up at the Supreme Court or Superior Court. So when we were asking questions last night, um, you know, I, we really, I, I think that that's an area where at least uh, open government activists and people interested in this issue should really maybe go see if we can yeah. back into the data yeah. because um, I don't know about you, but I personally think having sealed cases mm. is very For contrary right. to, um, to open government yeah. because historically and i mean historically from like the magna carta yeah. from the 20 you know 1200s uh courts have always been open yeah. you're supposed to actually face your accusers yeah. so there's a problem with this victim mentality where i understand the urge to protect a victim in a domestic violence yeah. or a rape case or whatever but the law has always said that, I mean, that's part of what the law is, yes. right? It's kind of saying you, know, you have it, right. to face your accuser. I mean, if you are going to take away someone's uh, life, then, you know, these are the rules that have always yes. been there. And they're slowly taking that away, so much so that this morning on Twitter, where no good things ever happened, <laughs> Um, I had tweeted something about Sunshine Week and this guy came at me and he was like, there's not one academic that I know who supports open government. Everything should be non-transparent because otherwise the lobbyists have the information. And I was like, look, I haven't read his academic paper yet. It has 800 citations. So I will go look at that to be legitimate and sort of see if we can have that dialogue. But I don't know about you guys, but do you think anything benefits from more no. secrecy? No. Especially when it's people who are taking your money and they're like, trust us. Right. It'll be good. It'll all be good. I don't trust it at all. All right. It's Tuesday. It's it voting day. It is Tuesday, day, right? voting day in Ward 9, special election for Alderman. We'll see how that turns out. Um, also, it is the week before crossover in the New Hampshire legislature. That means next week. Uh, crossover week, all the bills that originated in the House need to move over to the Senate, and all the House bills that originated in the Senate must move over to the House. It is a hard, fast deadline where days get very, very long. Um, the it, two years ago, they were 
when the Democrats were in control and COVID was just bubbling up, uh, they were forced to stay there till 4 a.m. So that was kind of ironic that they were locking in people in a in the in reps hall when they knew COVID was running around. Eh. But yeah. anyways, um, there's I was laughing this morning that the gold standard put out by New Hampshire Liberty Alliance is like 20 pages long. Wow. So there's a gazillion because they're doing uh, today, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday house sessions because they want to. The, the goal is you get rid of as much as you can before next week. Um, what made me start looking, beside the fact that there's a ton of interesting bills, was I was reading uh, something bubbled up in Facebook about, um, I think it was Citizens something. I don't even know. I could probably tell you. Citizens Granite State. New, oh, it was just awful. Sit, anyways, it was about a bill that would require landlords to not discriminate against those um, with Section 8 housing vouchers. So basically, if you are getting your rent paid for through the federal government Section 8 program, which is low-income people, and you go to apply for an apartment, a landlord would no longer be able to say, we don't take Section 8. Oh, interesting. So what's interesting about it is people, people get really up to get... They get all worked up over a lot of landlord tenant <laughs> stuff that Yeah, everyone just really... wants to live in their free little right. pods. Well, we and, get it. Folks. And um what this bill would do is actually force property owners to enter into a contract with the government. You have to remember that it's not protecting you know, there's a there's the tenant and there's the government and there's the property owner. Well, normally the property owner and the tenant are negotiating and yep. there's, you know, discrimination That's laws the nexus. there. Yeah. But when you interject the government, now you're saying that somehow the government is a protected class because you must let the government Section 8 prevail. And it's just not good. So many times... <laughs> When you read and you hear... Stop fixing things! Well, that's what it is with the landlord-tenant laws. And I try to be objective because I remember what it was like to rent, you know, but I also remember that I was always able to rent. And I do understand that there's a housing shortage, but I don't really know if that has anything to do with landlord-tenant law. Um, I also can completely appreciate the fact that people's rents are increasing because everything is increasing. Ooh, so uh, inflation, the oh hidden tax on you, the thing that when the government gives you free stuff, later bites you in the butt, yeah. like $5 gasoline, yep. which is gonna well, keep and going food up. prices and everything, all the so prices are going up. Today, uh, Disclose TV, right before I walked in, said the official... Uh, the official inflation rate now 10%. It was 7% on Sunday, I was going to say, earlier in the week. Um, so that's alarming. Yeah. But shadow stats, which is your friend, if you actually want to know what's going on and not just get the stories that they're, you know, feeding to you, uh, it's almost 20. It's re Things are very expensive. We I might mean say it's probably at least. 21% because that is the raise that Congress gave themselves in their 70 million page bill that no one read that they all voted on that is just going to make us even more bankrupt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so over the weekend, so that that bill made me start to think Dan and I were in reading in Sunday, I think it was in Sunday's paper. Don't quote me. It was either on Manchester Ink Link or in the Union Leader. And it was the plight of some families who are being they claim forced out of their apartments because there's a loophole supposedly in the law that allows landlords to evict tenants so that they can do renovations. And these tenants are saying, well, the landlords are using this for more than renovation. They're using it to just get people out and get people in at higher rents. But then it, it I always feel like this really Ogre, this big ogre because my pity drops. I start out with like, well, that's not really right. You know, like you're living, you know, the story was this woman and she lives in, you know, she was in her forties and she lives in this apartment and her mother lives there with her, I think, or maybe her mother lives across the hall. And there were, she has two teenage sons that live here sometime and da, 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 all this stuff. And her landlord um, is evicting her because he says he needs to um, renovate. Well, then as the story goes on, and I, I'll feel bad if I'm conflating two families, but one of the cases was actually the landlord was trying to sell the building and could not sell it because of the conditions of the t that the tenant was keeping. So people are like, well, I'd like to buy your building, 
but that's a big hot mess. Like, that's disgusting. So you've got, like, there's all these protections, and I feel bad, but it's like some people just don't really appreciate that, one, it's not your property. You are renting that space from somebody who actually owns and is responsible for that property. I appreciate the fact that there are a lot of landlords that are slumlords and don't take care of their properties. Um, but everybody can't expect everything to be free. You know, like there's this culture of give me, give me, give me. I need more. And all of the stories, I mean, there was one where there was a family. I think it was the family that was, I think the, the woman with the two sons and the mother. All I kept thinking was, so you work and your mother's, she said is on, uh, been on those section eight waiting list forever. And I'm like, okay, so you must be close to low. But she undoubtedly gets social security. And I'm like, so wait a minute, you got a social security income and a working income. So there's probably a way to pay for rent. And then there was another family, another story. And it was like the same thing. There's multiple adults. You know, and it always seems like everybody's disabled. You notice that lately? Everybody's disabled. Everything's a disability. But even if you are disabled, you're getting a disability check. You're getting a social security check. You're all these things. And I'm like, I don't understand why people are struggling to pay $1,000 a month rent when there's multiple adults with incomes. I'm like, I had to pay for rent. I, we were just re talking about rents. You know, 20 some years ago, probably like 25 years ago when I first moved to New Hampshire, my rent was $650 a month, a quarter of a century ago. It was a little bit of a shock to me coming from upstate New York where my rent, you know, rent was cheaper, but this is the choice I made. I didn't go, well, you know, somebody's got to subsidize me. Well, I think that's just part of where we are as a society is I think we have more than half the people do think everything should be subsidized. And sadly, most of that is just purely because people do not understand economics. No. Like I often say, and people don't always like this, but I'm like libertarians often, or at least I, you know, I sort of came from the left, but I'm like, well, I, I, I'm like, oh, I was a progressive who studied and now understand economics. And here's the thing about economics. The laws of economics are immutable. The right. laws of supply and demand aren't theories. They aren't, oh, we think this is how it yep. works. It is how it works. Right. And so we know, because those laws of economics are immutable, yep. that certain things can be predicted. Like we're not geniuses. Right, I don't, you don't have to be it's, a rocket scientist. You, to you just it's literally math. can look at things and go. Well, that's not gonna. <laughs> so, so, so one of those immutable laws that no one wants to talk about is what you subsidize, you get more of. We have said that before on the show. And so here's an example. We have an obesity crisis in America. What does the federal government subsidize? Corn and sugar. Yep. What is in everything, corn including your sugar. like your salad dressing? Corn. Corn and sugar. What makes you fat and obese and unhealthy? Corn. Corn and sugar. And sugar. So we can draw a direct line yep. back to the people who claim that they are looking out for your health and be like, that's rubbish. You have literally with the food pyramid, the original one, they of course kind of changed it because they were like, oops, mm. someone from the FDA just came out in the last 10 days and they were like, yeah, this so, isn't good. Uh, maybe carbs. Uh, maybe don't eat so all the good. bread. Don't eat all the carbs. So right. they are slowly <laughs> moving towards that. And I think it's partly because we have to get people healthy. Right. Like, like here's the point. Like, if you spent two years being afraid, then you're probably not healthy. And so instead of just putting on your mask, you might want to go. What is my body mask index? Am I getting enough sleep? Am I right. looking after myself? What am I eating? Do I need to reach for that bagel? You right. know, so so it ultimately comes up to you. So with, with rents, you get more of yep. what you subsidize. So if we are subsidizing Section 8 housing because people are saying they can't afford their rents, then we are going to get more, more people. people want I mean, there's a great, there's a great episode on... Um, I will say bullshite. I think I'm allowed to get away with it, but it was the uh, Penn and Teller show, yep. right? And they did one on uh, the the. Uh, my mom has one, like the the decal for parking. Yes. So handicap yes. parking, and um, 
And from the time that was introduced, like they said, oh, it's for these narrow things. Yeah, and now, you can actually look at the abuse that happens because you create a gateway and people are opportunistic yeah. and they're going to take yeah. advantage. When you give people free stuff, they're going to take it. Yeah. So stop giving them free stuff. It was always amazing to me. I used to work for um, in, in the medical field and... The stories, I, I, you know, the you, these patients that are on Medicaid, and you're not like I get that if you're poor and you need medical care, that's one thing. But you know, people who have knee injuries, right? They they can't walk, they can't work because their knee pain is so bad. But they're talking about going out dancing, and now that's when it really bothers their knee. <laughs> is when they're and I'm like, I used to sit there and think, so maybe not go out dancing and go to work instead. Like make those decisions. Maybe you should be going to work and not having. Uh, and it, I I saw, but it's a mentality it and it's a culture of mentality that we just keep growing more and more people who want who believe that they're entitled to more and more of other people's prosperity. Well, and maybe that's the disconnect is that people don't actually think about where the money comes from. It's free. Like I don't think you if know? you ask an average let's say like high school student now and they're like, "Oh yeah, people should, you know, we should help everyone." Of course okay. it feels How like a we? really good sentiment. No one's like, "Oh, we want people to suffer." In fact, we are trying to figure out a way where less people would suffer because there has to be personal <laughs> responsibility. Right. There has to be you can't like get free stuff and then be like, "Oh, I'm not going to work." And Someone needs to, I mean, you can, but at some stage, the someone needs to take care of me system, part of the system doesn't work anymore. And that's where you get inflation and eventually probably a dollar collapse, right? right? So, so you know, it, it, we need to rebalance. We need to rebalance and people need to... Um, so, so I heard an interesting <laughs> thing about the word responsibility that it really resonated with me. I was listening to some audio book and um, they actually talked about how responsibility is actually the, the two elements is ability mm. and response, mm. meaning response, ability. So you actually have the capability, the mental capability and the control uh, through your choices, through your diet, how healthy you are, all of that. I mean, I think part of health is actually brain yes. health, and that's sleep. Sleep, sleep, sleep. Must sleep. So responsibility is actually, the, it's built into this notion that you have to be capable, the, have the ability to, to respond resp proper, properly. Okay. And I think that when we talk about personal responsibility, Based on the way we've created our systems, the way we're teaching children in school, this constant victim narrative, this constant fear narrative. I mean, frankly, the people who have been telling you about climate change have been telling you the world's going to end since the 70s. Yeah. So if you're still believing them while they buy properties right. <laughs> on the coast and fly around with their private jets, then I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you, but I'm going to tell you, I think you're being foolish. Um, this is exploitative politics. Yeah. That's all it is. These people are all taking advantage of you. So the best thing you can do is take responsibility, figure out how to be your own unit. I know I'm saying it every week now, but no, this, it's a, this it's, it's is a real thing. thing. Um, so we have all these crazy oh, bills coming up. Well, there's up. tons of stuff. I was just flipping through. Um, I found this one interesting. This is a um, this has got an ought to pass as amended recommendation. It, HB 1132 relative to applications for charter conversion school. This bill removes the requirement for a vote of teachers, superintendents, and principals for conversion of a regular public school to a charter public school. And I thought, what? Why are we? Why are the teachers, the superintendent, and the principal the ones voting? And this bill would say. They the people have, have to, to vote. vote because it is my money, and right. your money. So that's the thing. Um, I did. They, oh, there's a bunch of bills where um, the left is trying to diminish or repeal the education freedom accounts, which I'm going to say it. I always say it. If you're full pro education, you're either pro child or you're pro school building. Um, pro child means you want to educate every single child that you can as best as you can. Pro school building means you just want to keep going down the road that we're in, which has produced like 
abysmal you know, results here in Manchester. That's the other thing that just actually astounds me is I think that part of critical thinking is curiosity. And I think that they have, uh, so <laughs> I'm being confronted with all these people who are like, but how would that work? What is the answer? What is the plan? What is the, you know, and, and I'm just like, well, figure it out. Right. There's not always like, an like, obvious answer to to every problem. First of all, problems aren't always problems. And there could be like 12 solutions right. or 100 and might, solutions. And it might be a combination of 12 different solutions that are actually the best solution for the most people. Exactly. Because everything that we change, everything we have legislation about and whatnot, so, so, might not be 100% for every person. So everyone goes, well, uh, you know, I mean, Based on how upset everyone seems to be and polarized everyone seems to be, no one thinks we're like on the right path. But anyone who comes with a fresh idea and is like, why don't we try this? Or what about this? Or education freedom counts? Or more independence? Or nullifying laws? Or whatever it is, everyone's like, no, you can't do that. And it's like, but guys, what we've got is not working yep. for anyone. Yep. So maybe we need to be more innovative, visionary, futurist, and kind of go, hey, we can figure it out. Let's be optimistic. Yep. It's possible. Yep. Where there's a will, there's a way. This is true. Um, if you have any questions, you have any suggestions, you have any opinions that you'd like to share with us, you can do so by emailing us at Manch. We welcome your hate mail. Uh, <laughs> Manchtalk at gmail.com. Uh, you can always rewatch our shows on YouTube and Odyssey. Do we do Odyssey? It is we on Odyssey, Odyssey as Somebody well. Somebody asked me that the other day. And yep. I was like, yeah, I'm not really sure. I just don't Yeah, do actually, part. it populates automatically when I put nice. it on YouTube. It does um, it on Odyssey. And until then, uh, enjoy the warm weather. It's been pretty good most days. Even when we have snow, it still melts the next day we're in that mode um and we'll be back next tuesday for another wonderful show um that's all we got have a great week thanks guys Bye. peace out